want to express my deep appreciation to the Society of General Internal Medicine for recognizing my advocacy concerning the care of people with pain and people with addiction through this David Calkins Advocacy Award. And I'm very thankful to Dr. Kirk Kroenke for this nomination. My passion has always been to improve care for people whose needs might seem difficult to meet, often people who have faced social adversity, who have disability and pay. These are people who, when you ask them, often say that our care is less than helpful. Following that passion has often led me to notice how the standards we use to improve healthcare sometimes make a fetish of what is easiest to measure, but what's easily measured isn't necessarily what's good for a given person. For a time, our profession embraced one easy number, the pain score, and we overlooked downsides to heavy opioid prescribing. We contributed to a problem. A course correction turned into something else, however. Officials, advocates, prosecutors, journalists, politicians, and families demanded rapid changes without they or we possessing an understanding of what it means to change the care of people with long-term pain. We didn't put much thought into understanding how we might know when a change had actually caused harm. I saw written directives declaring that prescribing would drop by a fixed amount per year. Quality metric agencies embraced dose thresholds that purport to differentiate care that's good from care that's bad, even if that effectively mandated dose reduction across the board. And they did that even when professionals who had assisted the CDC's guideline urged them not to. Milligrams became the new pain scores. In 2017, at a meeting of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services on the opioid crisis, a room full of insurance vice presidents announced that they had reduced milligrams faster than expected. Only a few mentioned addiction or pain care. None mentioned naloxone. My colleagues and I saw patients harmed, and we realized early that most policy actors were not planning to track the outcomes of their actions. To speak up on all this involved professional risk. It drew criticism. One night I told my friend Saul Weiner, another SGIM member, that I was feeling afraid. He said, you're feeling afraid because the thing you're doing requires courage. But what helped me move forward despite fear is that a lot of people stuck their necks out. They helped me write for the literature and for the press and sign letters to officials. And while patients are still right now at risk, we have begun to shift how this topic is discussed. That couldn't have happened without people who walked with me, challenged me and corrected me. I wanna thank Adam Gordon, AJ Manhapra, Alison Varley, Sally Sattel, Saul Weiner, pain and rehabilitation scholars, Terry Lewis and Beth Darnell, attorney Kate Nicholson, and a patient named Dan Fuqua, and many others who are unnamed. And given who I am, I could not have done any of this without kindness, tolerance, and acceptance for my son Gabriel and my wife Alice, who know more about opioids than would make sense under any normal circumstances. And despite the intensity of all that advocacy, they seem okay with keeping me around for the foreseeable future. And that has been the greatest thing of my life. Thank you very much. Thank you.